comes to dance. Glad you're all here this morning. We've been taking quite a, a long look at uh, lessons from the wise, and we're looking at the, the lives of the wise men. Uh, just before I get into the talk this morning, uh, I just wanted you to be aware, uh, this time of year, weather can create some challenges, and uh, we understand that. First thing you should know is we actually never cancel a service based on a weather forecast. We actually wait to see what it's going to do. Our forecasters do the best job that they can, and we're grateful for them. But uh, it can differ a lot, just even uh, neighborhood by neighborhood. Secondly is our decision to have our facility open will be determined by our ability to have a safe place here. So if our lot is plowed and our sidewalks are uh, shoveled and, uh, uh, it's a, and our heat is on, the lights work, uh, we'll have service. Sometimes there can be a delay or sometimes there can be a cancellation. Um, if you check our website, if you check our, uh, if you call into the church, if you check your email, if you look on the church uh, app, any of those things will update you so you'll be aware within an hour before a service. And uh, we realize where you are, there might be more snow than what we have. And so we just ask you to make the best decision you can for where you are. We'll try to make sure that our facility here is safe. Everybody got it? All right. Lessons from the wise. We're in Matthew chapter 2. We've been just adding to the verses as we go. And so by now you should be fairly familiar with it. But it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I, too, may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What is something you might be willing to devote all of your free time to for two years? Every moment of free time. For some people, if their marriage is stressed or struggling, they might be willing to devote every free minute they could to make that marriage healthier. For some people, if their children were struggling with something significant or beginning to engage in patterns that could wind up diminishing their potential, there's a lot of parents that would devote every minute they had for two years to try to turn that situation around. If you have a compulsive pattern in your life that diminishes your health or creates distance between you and others, uh, that might be something worth spending all of your free time on. Or maybe a new skill or a new hobby, or getting in shape, although all the commercials seem to indicate that in just a few minutes, within a week or two, you will be in the peak position, condition of your life, or education. The truth is, is that we start out with a lot of good intentions, but somewhere along the way, we run out of steam. We just give up. What is it that's going to keep us going? And a lot of people think that it's feelings. As long as I feel strongly about something or feel good about something, I'll, I'll keep going. And the answer to that is, you should know, feelings fluctuate pretty widely and fairly quickly. And they tend not to sustain us for a long season. Other people think it's, it's their, their capacity to exercise their will, their willpower. And what I want you to know is uh, there's, a, there's a wide fluctuation between willpower in terms of uh, how long people can commit to something, but eventually even our willpower breaks down, especially when we feel like we're out of control. 
when the circumstances around us are not controlled by us, our will begins to break underneath that. So what is it that's going to keep us going, keep us motivated, even beyond our feelings or our capacity to exert our will? I think the wise men, the magi, give us a powerful lesson in this. Uh, what's true is that in our culture, um, we have a lot of ways to try to uh, distract ourselves from boredom. Uh, our culture doesn't do boredom very well. And so we have lots of technology and options to be able to think about and do something else. And, and our culture really doesn't handle any kind of pain very well. We, we have a lot of options available to us to kind of numb the pain in our lives. But here's what I want you to know, is that we need something that can push through boredom and even endure pain because it's worthwhile. And if we constantly surrender just because we lose interest or because something becomes difficult, we're going to wind up missing out on some of the greatest treasures that God has for us in our world. So what is it that's going to keep moving us on? And I, I think it has to do with our passion levels. And I think the Magi are a great picture to look at because they started a journey that Bible scholars tell us lasted about two years. Can you imagine taking a trip that would last two years. I mean, we used to drive to Florida when our kids were little, and we weren't 30 minutes out of the house. And they were asking me, are we there yet? And I would tell them, yes, but it's going to take me about 20 and a half hours to find a place to park. <laughs> this is going to be hard. So. The Magi engaged on a journey which traveling in the ancient world was even more demanding than it is now because it was difficult. You had to bring a lot of your provisions with you. Secondly, you couldn't just take any route you wanted. There were very well-known routes and you had to stay on them. Thirdly, it was dangerous because not only were there animals that you had to fend off who were hungry and skilled at killing, but there were actually robbers and thieves that would try to take from you. You didn't travel alone. You didn't travel off well-known paths. And you had to take a lot of provisions with you just to get through something like this. And the question I have is, what kept them going? You know, six months in and they hadn't found the Christ child yet, why didn't they just go, yeah, I'm, I'm heading home? A year in, 18 months in, they're still going. Just think about that. Well, I think the key is found in this, and that is the wise seek something worthy of worship. Notice I didn't say the wise seek something to worship. Everybody finds that. Everyone worships something or someone. But they wouldn't settle for anything less than someone who is worthy of worship. That worship actually comes from two words. First is worth, what do we value? And the second is ship. And you might think that ship on the end of a word is an ancient term and we don't use it much anymore. I actually checked it out. We have 541 words in the English language that end with ship, S-H-I-P, and it identifies a number of things. For instance, it identifies quality, all right? For example, in a relationship, there's a difference between a relationship and a courtship. Okay? It says something about the quality. Or it might identify a skill, like penmanship, which no teacher ever accused me of having, or craftsmanship, you know, someone who's, who's skilled at being able to make something. It identifies a group, for example, readership, those who read certain publications. It identifies position like lordship or leadership or internship. It's a word that's still very much in use. And what it's telling us is, is that there's someone that is valuable that we should be thinking about. Not only the skills that they possess and the position that they hold, but the quality of relationship that's possible with them. And this is what kept the wise men going. Now, we all have things that we kind of take pride in. Uh, one time I, I, I had bought my grandmother's house when we lived in Jamestown, New York, and my grandfather had painted one side of the house every year so that every four years the house was painted. And so that was his strategy, and, uh, and, and he became ill, and so for a lot of years no paint, painting got done. You could, you could see the stress and, and the peeling and the chips and all of that, and so there were so many layers of paint that I decided I was going to take it right down to the clap boards. And so I got a blowtorch. 
See, some of you know something I didn't know. And so I would go out and I, I'd climb up on the ladder, which I'm not crazy about being in high places, and I would, I would wave the blowtorch and the, the paint would bubble up and then I'd scrape it off with a scraper. And uh, one day as I'm waving the blowtorch along, part of the clapboard caught on fire, which is a problem. <laughs> and, I, and I put the fire out, but, but when I got down off the ladder and I started thinking about this, I thought, you know, no insurance company is going to pay me if this house burns down because the neighbors are going to tell them that I've been trying to set it on fire for days. <laughs> Finally got it to burn. And so I went to a hot air gun. But I can remember every time I would complete a section, I would get down the ladder and I'd look back at it and just, I would kind of take pride in the work that was done. There are things that we can take pride in. There are things that we think make elevate our status a little bit. There are things that when we obtain or acquire, makes us feel a little bit safer, a little bit more secure. There are things that make us feel a little bit more significant. But there really is only one, one being in all the universe who's worthy of our worship. It, it's not wrong to appreciate that you have good things or enjoy good things, but if you, if you turn that into an ultimate thing, the whole system breaks down very quickly. Until we have a relationship with the true and the living God, we will be tempted to make a God out of something or someone. And that doesn't go so well. You know, parents can try to make a God out of their children. It's hard to believe. First of all, children will sometimes act like God in the house. I've noticed that. And uh, they, they give a lot of orders. But beyond that, you know, parents will... If their child doesn't perform well in something, they're not just disappointed, they're devastated by it. How does that happen? And the answer is this, that they're trying to elevate their status as a person by proving to everyone what a good parent they are. And then when their kid comes in in an underperforming sort of way, they take that personally. And, and here's what you need to know. We can do that to our spouses. We can do that to our friends. We can do that to our jobs. We, we can do that to anyone in our life. And here's the problem. As soon as we start turning a good thing into an ultimate thing, they will resent it and you will always be disappointed. There's only one being in all the universe that can actually take the pressure of being God in your life. And that's the true and the living God. So, how do we keep our passion levels for that true and living God in a healthy place where they should be? And I think the wise men teach us some incredible lessons about that. And the first is, wise people keep passion at healthy levels by rejecting isolation. By rejecting isolation. We all need community. We're not created for solitary confinement or existence. But we often assess the available community to us as not enough for us. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We can be too busy. Uh, we can be too tired. Uh, how many are a little bit tired this morning? And some of you are just too tired to raise your hand. <laughs> and, and we can feel empty, like, well, I don't have anything to offer, so I shouldn't go. And since we have so little to offer, we avoid getting together. And here's what I need you to know this morning is you cannot maintain healthy passion levels on your own. I'm not saying it's hard. I'm telling you it's not possible. The Magi traveled together. And if one started to get weak or one started to get intimidated by some of the uh, difficulties or the dangers of the journey, they had each other to keep each other moving in a positive direction. They encouraged each other. This is another thing is that in your life, there is no failure that you will endure that will actually destroy you. It will discourage you. And when we become discouraged, we withdraw from community with others and from relationship. And that's what actually does us in. That's what does us in. So, we have to war against isolation. We, we need to schedule community. We need to invite community. We need to accept community. And by the way, community doesn't mean that you just get to people who uh, get together with people who like the same things you like and do the same things you do. Yeah. Our entire culture lives in an echo chamber now where we only listen to the voices that already agree with us. 
And here's what I want you to know. You are sitting next to someone right now that doesn't completely agree with you. One spouse just said, they don't ever agree with me. <laughs> and that's not true, all right? There might not be a lot of things, but there's something. There's no two people who think exactly alike. And it is not a healthy thing to require that someone be a mirror reflection of you before you will spend time with them. We have to be willing to embrace the fact that people who have different views and different skills and different ways of doing things, different ways of seeing things, that we can actually all get together and benefit from that relationship. So here's a verse of scripture, and I'd like us to read this out loud and together. It's from Hebrews chapter 10. Ready? And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. See, we just need to embrace community. But wise people also keep their passion levels healthy by welcoming God's methods. Welcoming God's methods. This is surprising, is how rarely God would do something the way we would do it. The, the wise men had been given some valuable information, first in a passage from Numbers 24, and then after speaking with the chief priests and teachers of the law, a passage from Micah 5, and they combined that scriptural information with a supernatural anomaly in the heavens that also aided to guide them, and it led them to an obscure location. It wasn't a major metropolitan area. And uh, so they wind up in Bethlehem, and not just kind of a, a backwater town, but in a stable on top of that. And God seems to be deciding to change the world by bringing another baby into it. And it's amazing how many people just don't accept that that's how God does things. It's possible to reject the miracles of God simply because they don't happen the way we thought they would. God is not limited to our methods. Let's read this verse out loud and together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God can do more than you can imagine. And he can do those things in ways beyond our imagination. We just have to embrace the methods of God. If you are willing to consider that God can do something more than what you can do, it's amazing how that affects your passion levels. Wise people also keep their passion levels healthy by accepting God's selection. By accepting God's selection. Joseph and Mary are not people you would have chosen. They were poor. God actually did not choose them for their ability. He chose them for their availability. When you read carefully the story of the angel visiting uh, Mary, what you discover is he provided her an opportunity and she gave permission for that to happen. The same with Joseph. He was planning to divorce Mary, but after an, an, a visit from an angel, he made a change in his plans. It was their availability to the purposes of God that allowed something miraculous to happen in our world. And please understand this. You would be astonished. Nope. You would be embarrassed at who God will use. There are some of us that will only accept something from God if it comes through a person we approve. That's a risky place to put. You could miss out a lot of miracles that God has for your life by deciding who God can use and who God will choose. It's amazing who God will use. And I've got lots of stories for that, just not enough time to tell you. So Ephesians chapter 2, let's read this out loud and together. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We have been created for good works that God has prepared. And when you read that passage, I don't want you to just think about a collective group of people. You are God's handiwork. It's amazing not only how 
Often, we reject the selection of someone else God is bringing into our lives, but we reject God's selection when it's us. We, we disqualify ourselves. And uh, we need to learn how to, to allow what God has chosen to be good enough for us. You cannot tell who God will use. Another thing that wise people do to keep their passion levels at a healthy level is they appreciate God's timing. They appreciate God's timing. We are not good at waiting. We're not. Um, we don't like to wait. I was in the grocery store last night, and I walked by several aisles who had too many carts with too many items in the carts in it. Why do I not just get in the closest aisle? No, no, no. Uh, this is a time of year when people are washing their cars. Temperature goes up a little bit. And there's lanes to get into the bays. And I always look for what I think is going to be the quickest way through there. Because I don't like to wait. Is anybody else here not like to wait? I could just wait until you all raise your hand, but <laughs> proving my point is not necessarily in my advantage right there. Uh, what's fascinating here is that God had actually factored in the travel and preparation time required for the Magi to be able to be in the right place at the right time to see the Christ child. He brought to their attention the information they needed two years in advance so at just the right time they would be in just the right place. The challenge for us, of course, is that uh, we have kind of imposed timelines or even worse deadlines that we want God to do something by. And in my experience, God is usually earlier than I want him to be or later than I want him to be, but he very rarely does something just when I think it should happen. It's, it's just, it's kind of how, and this is the thing. There's a great verse in the Old Testament that says this, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. I, I really felt God whisper this to my heart when we were worshiping today. And uh, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And there might be some people here and they're saying, well, I've been waiting and I'm getting weak. And here's what I would ask you. Are you waiting on the Lord or are you waiting on someone or something else? Because it's when we wait on something or someone else that we get tired and weary. When you wait on the Lord, he strengthens and sustains you. Here's a great verse of scripture for this. Psalm 27, it says, let's say it out loud and together. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the... Let's just read that again. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. Appreciate the timing of God. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. God's timing is perfect. He will bring direction and intervention into our lives at just the right time. Uh, the last thing that wise people do to keep their healthy passion or their passion levels healthy is that they know how to give. They're just good at it because here's what's true. You might get a really good gift on Christmas Day and you open it and you'll be excited, but that excitement is going to have a, a pretty quick... Um, half-life. It's just going to keep going down. We don't maintain passion by what we get. We maintain passion by what we give. And there's just something remarkable that when you release resources into uh, the work of God in the world, you, you don't feel so much like an observer or a spectator. You start feeling like a partner. And that can make your passion levels ride really high. Here's the thing to recognize about that, though, and that is that where giving starts is the giving of ourselves, the giving of our own heart to God. That's a really big deal. It, it tells us in the story that we just read that when the, when the wise men came, when the magi came, what they did is they bowed down and they worshipped. Uh, this will be mildly offensive to some people, but I just have to say it, and that is watching is not the same thing as worshipping. Being in the same space where worship is occurring and even enjoying the worship that others are doing is not the same thing as engaging in worship. Watching is watching. Worshiping requires that you give something of yourself. 
And God always calls us to that first before we start giving anything else. And so they, they knelt down and, and they worshiped and then they started opening their gifts, gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. The equivalent of that today is gift cards, scented candles, and perfume. <laughs> We've not really improved on gift giving in 2,000 years. It's the same thing. But the idea is that that is where it starts. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. Let's say this out loud. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver that sometimes our passion levels wane because of what we hold on to rather than what we release. Look, being a wise person doesn't require that you live in denial. And what I can tell you is, is that there's nothing that you can actually do to force your passion levels upward. This is not if you do this, your passion levels will grow. This is if you do this, you're creating an environment for God to do something in you. And he's the one who keeps our passion levels growing. That's what makes the difference. Let's bow our heads this morning. Two-year journey, and it ended with bent knees and open gifts. And if you ask the Magi if that was worth it, they would tell you yes for what they found was not what they expected, but more than they expected. And every moment of that journey became part of their story, one I'm sure they told over and over again. Father, I know that there are some in the room today who are growing weary. It's not just a physical fatigue of of the demands of a busy schedule, but it's the emotional and the spiritual fatigue, sometimes of just being isolated, sometimes not recognizing who it is you're bringing into our life, sometimes becoming impatient because things are not happening or changing at the pace that we have required. And our motivation, our energy, our passion, well, it's starting to wane. And I just ask that you would help us in this place today to put our eyes on you and to accept and appreciate the gifts you have brought into our lives and to be willing to open our hearts and our hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.